So now that we have a method to load the occupation data, now we need um, a method that will return an occupation um, given an occupation type. So if you look at, let's, let's open up the Excel file. So if we look at uh, these management occupations, we need something that will return one of these um, randomly, but with their proportions that are equivalent to uh, their populations. So this one, for instance, occurs um, is, is much more uh, abundant than, say, this one. So we need to maintain those ratios in our selection. So I'm going to create a function that actually returns occupation data. And I'm going to call it get random occupation. And we'll give it an occupation type. We'll call it O type. Um, so we want to make sure that our database is actually set up. So, so we're going to do database. Um, so if, if database is null or database, so you can do or with the double pipe, database dot count equals zero then we're going to throw a new exception and we'll say no jobs let's we'll say no occupations loaded in a database. All right, and then um, we're going to get, or we're going to get a list of occupations of this type. So we can do that by saying occupations. And uh, that's why it was nice to use the uh, the dictionary because you can do this now. So that, that this basically creates a reference um, to this um, list of occupation data. So now basically what we want to do is uh, sum up this column, the percent population. We want to sum that up. So, so we'll create a variable some PCT for some percent equals zero. And we can do a for each here. And then basically we'll add that. So that becomes O dot uh, percent population. <laughs> And then the next thing we need to do is um, draw a random number from a uniform distribution and then figure out which occupation that corresponds to. And this is kind of similar to how we did the months, how we determined um, what month we're in given a day using the find month algorithm. It's conceptually the same idea. So we'll do var r equals random dot range. And we're going to draw a number between 0 and some percent. And so if you, you know, if you, if you think about these being intervals on a number line between 0 and whatever some percent is, uh, basically we, we pick a number in between, and uh, we basically just have to figure out, like, what bin we're in. Um, and the way that we'll do that is basically by reiterating over the array, or over the uh, the occupations. Um, so I'm actually going to reuse some percent because we'll need to add up the uh, the percent populations as we go, so we can compare it to our R value. 
Uh, so this starts at at zero, and um, basically we want to go ahead and do this operation first, and then we can look to see if r is less than or equal to some percent. And if that's the case, then we know um, o is the, the interval that we're in. So then we could return o. So we're turning occupation data. And that's pretty much um, all we need. Uh, this is complaining because it says not all code paths return a value. So say you got through this loop and uh, somehow this broke. Um, so here we want to return uh, a value that would let us know like it broke. Um, so ideally we want to return null. If we do that then it complains that it can't convert um, occupation data to a non-nullable value. And that's basically because occupation data is a struct and not a, um, a, public, a class. So I think I could actually change this to class, but the other thing we can do is, is make occupation data nullable, or have it return a nullable type. So basically, if you add a question mark to it, um, you can make uh, you can make what C sharp calls um, value types as opposed to reference types uh, nullable. So you can also have like a, a nullable float or a nullable bool or a nullable integer if you put the question mark after it. Um, and then you can use it pretty much like you would a, um, a an occupation data or a float or the regular bool, but you might have to cast it in some circumstances. All right, so um, that will return a random occupation, or if it fails, it'll return null. And so now we can basically have a method that will build the job list. So here I'm going to do build or um, void build job list. Um, the way this works is going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, basically, if you recall how the jobs are set up now, um, you can have a number of positions for any given job. So let's go up and look at our job class. So we have this num job positions. Um, so I don't want to to change it so like if you have like four um, janitors, it adds like four different uh, jobs to the jobs list. I want one janitor position with num job position set to four. Um, but if you think about how this is, or sorry, the get random occupation method is set up, this is going to just return a random one every single time. So we need to be able to match whether um, we've generated the same position, and then we can just increment up the uh, the num positions, num job positions. So the way that we'll do that is uh, we'll first build a job dictionary that will have uh, the title as a string, just because we know those are unique. The the occupation title as a key for the dictionary, and then the job um, as the value. And then the job list will basically become the values of the dictionary. So here I can do jobs dict equals new dictionary. And then this can be string job. And then um, Inside of here, I'm actually going to use a regular for loop since um, we want to basically iterate over the number of jobs. And then after we define that, basically for every job that we need uh, to create or job position, so what gets specified as um, workplace num employees. 
So for every one of those, we need to generate a random occupation, add that to the dot job sticks, or if it's already in the job stick, we need to just ramp up the number of employees that can hold that position until we've gone through all the number of employees. So here I need a, um, a for loop. I'll do INTI equals zero, I less than, um, and then this will be num employees. And then I'll do I plus plus. So we use this to get a random occupation. And we need to pass it the uh, occupation type. And that's the, you know, the, that's the drop down box. And then we want to check to make sure that O is not null. So we will do o, um, if O equals null. And that basically means that it didn't find um, an occupation and then it, it returned here instead of returning here, which should not happen. So if that happens, then we'll throw an error. So now we, uh, we found an occupation. We know that it's not null. Um, we need to add it to the job sticks, but I don't want to have to cast it as occupation type a bazillion times. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do is call this underscore o, underscore o, and then here I'm going to do var o equals occupation type underscore o. So that basically casts it as, as occupation type. And, uh, oh, sorry, not occupation type, occupation data. And then that way, uh, Visual Studio won't require me to do this, like, literally seven times. All right, so then we want to check to see if O is already in our job stick. So we can do jobs, jobs, dicts, dot, contains, key. And this returns the bool. So in the event that it does contain this, um, that's kind of the easy case. So in that case, we can actually just do jobs dict at o dot num job positions plus plus. Ah. Um, otherwise, we need to do jobs dict dot add. And then we'll do O, and uh, then we'll create. Need to create a new job. Um, so if we want to be able to do this in one line, we can actually uh, modify the, or we can add a, a public constructor to job. So we can do public job. And then um, it turns out that we can, we don't have to pass it every single one of these values. We can kind of figure some of these out. So from what we have, um, we have a, the title. Um, we want to specify the minimum job skill. And then we'll pass in the uh, median income, and from that we'll um, derive the salary range. So for the title, we just need to set that. And because I'm passing in the same name as I have here, I can make that, I can disambiguate that by doing this dot. Um, and then min, this dot min. Job skill required. Well, I need to set num job positions actually, because this is when it's first graded. So this needs to get set to one. And then the min job skill required will be this. Um, and then I need to set the salary range. 
and this is a new vector two. And here I'm just going to do 90% of whatever the median income is to 110% of what, whatever the median income is. And then uh, I don't think we actually need the unique IDs anymore, so I'm just going to take that off. I think, yeah, I think we got rid of it in the human already. Yeah, so the human doesn't have it, we'll just not worry about that. So now we can use this constructor to create our job. So that was uh, down here. And then this will be O dot this is not title, this is occupation. And then this is a required job skill. Okay, so yeah, th this is complaining because I actually want to do O dot uh, title, or O dot occupation. Um, so the, the key is, is a string, and so the, the occupation strings are unique for each occupation. So that'll just keep track of those. So if we, we make it through this list, then basically um, we just have to take the the jobs dict values and return, or basically set the jobs list with those. So we can actually do jobs equals jobs dict dot values. And uh, you'd think that would work, but that actually returns a value collection and not a list of jobs. Um, so we have to create a, a new list of job and then we can actually pass um, the, the value collection. Basically it's passing this, it's passing an ienumerable job collection. So an enumerable is basically an iterator, so the uh, the job list, or the list constructor goes through the enumerator and adds them to the list for us. So that's actually uh, it. Um, so to get this to work, we can actually use Unity's onValidate method. So you can do public void onValidate. And this is kind of like a start and update. Basically, this gets ran uh, whenever something gets changed in the editor. It'll run this code. Um, so just so it doesn't completely break, I want to uh, make sure that the number of employees is somewhat reasonable. Um, in the case that this gets set to zero, then we can basically clear it. So I can do if uh, num employees equals zero, then we can do jobs.clear, and then we don't have to waste our time doing anything else. Um, else if, and then I wanna make sure that it's greater than zero, and then, um, it's somewhat arbitrary, but I'm gonna make sure that it's less than or equal to 500. You know, I don't. I want someone to put like 50,000 in there and then have it get stuck in that loop and kind of seem like it's broken. Uh, so basically, what we need to do is load the occupation data, and then we need to build the job list. And we could actually maybe simplify that since this is going to happen every time. Maybe we should just do, or maybe we should do if data base equals null, then load the occupation data. 
Because otherwise it's, it's probably already loaded and we don't have to worry about it. Although if it yeah became null or like they made a change, then it would be then it wouldn't update. So maybe maybe we do want to do it every single time. Uh, yeah, and then we don't need this here. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and test this. I'm going to put occupation type on computer and mathematical occupations. And then let's uh, set this to 10. Ah, and we see that it's added six jobs. We have four computer software engineers. Their minimum job skill is 0.66. Okay, so if I, for, for the sake of just uh, doing a quick test, let's just duplicate this factory a couple times. And then uh, let's change the occupation type, and that actually changed the jobs list. Food preparation and related services. Um, let's go ahead and spread these out. going to save the scene and then we'll play. And they also have to remember that they're um, acquiring their jobs a lot slower than they used to be. Let's see what we might have done wrong here. Okay, it looks like uh, we for we aren't initializing this employees list for the job. Um, so we can actually do that when we start up workplace. So here we also need to do job dot employees equals new list of human. Okay, so we can see that the, uh, the uh, well, the computer programmers are populating. So let's just give the factory a, a little bit. They have lower attainment values in it. It will take them longer to start job seeking. <laughs> you can actually see their uh, co-workers with the same position on here now. Oh, and then we must have passed a month because their wealth is accumulating. Okay, so uh, this position has jobs filled. Alright, so that looks like it's working. Uh, so we have our human data dump script, and it would almost be nice if it would do this periodically. And it turns out it's actually not that hard to set it up to do that. Uh, so let's go ahead and and do that just for the sake of convenience. Again, I'd like a, a drop down box that would let that lets me specify the interval at which it um, dumps out data. So here I'll create a public Enum. And 
And then if I go back to here, I need a public uh, property of that. So that would be time interval. I'll call this uh, interval, or I'll call this dump interval. And I'll set this to time interval dot none by default. So then in start, I basically need to look at this um, interval and then based on that subscribe to um, subscribe generate report to that uh, event. Um, there is one little gotcha. So if you recall, our time constructors are expecting a method that takes um, an integer. So I'm going to create another generate report that takes an integer, and I'll just call this int x. And inside of here, I just am going to call a uh, generate report. Um, and then this is called overloading. You've used it, but you I don't I don't think I've shown you this up till this point. So you can actually within a class you can actually define multiple methods, um, or you can define a method and um, with multiple ways of calling it. So you can call generate report with um, with nothing, or you can call generate report with int x. Another sort of um, thing to consider is that our generate report has this debug.log, and this is really nice when we run it from the um, the editor, so because we get that feedback. But if this is uh, running on an interval, then it's just going to uh, pr provide more garbage to sort through in our console. So there's another thing that we can do here. We can actually have an optional variable. So I'll create a bool named a uh, debug log, and then I can put an optional parameter. So I'm going to set this to true. And then down here I can do if debug log, then debug log. So it'll basically behave as it would uh, with the editor script. Um, this is optional, so this doesn't have to be supplied. Um, but then in here, I can do debug log um, true to tell it, OK, I'm providing this optional variable, and I'm passing in the value true. Or actually, I'm passing in the value false, because I don't want to um, actually produce that log. So inside of here, I can do switch dump interval. And then just depending on what my dump interval is, I can um, assign generate report to the right time controller. Okay, so uh, that um, that sets up the methods. There's one other thing that we should probably take care of, and that's that um, the the file name. We probably don't want the file name to be the same thing. So instead of file name, um, well, I'm gonna call this file name prefix. I'll just change this to human data. And then down here, we can create a human name that encodes the, the simulation uh, day and month, or day and hour and minute. So then here we can do string file name equals and uh, let's go ahead and use string.format. 
So basically, we want to give it the file name. Oh, sorry, zero. So that's the file name prefix. And then uh, let's do a space. And then let's give it the the day. And then we'll do the um, hour. And we'll do minutes. And uh, we should pad the minutes. Well, let's let's pad all of these. So what I mean by pad is like let's put uh, leading zeros so that they're always the same number of characters. So if we always want this to be um, six characters in length, so for for instance, if it's day one, then it would be five zeros and a one. Then we can do d six, and then if we want this to be D2, or sorry, if we want this to be uh, two digits, we can do D2 for the minutes and hours, because hour will always be between 0 and 21, and uh, minutes will always be 0 to 59. So then that would end up being file name prefix, um... So now we actually need to find the a reference to the time controller. And then here we would do tc.day tc.hour and tc.minute Okay, so uh, if we go back to Unity now, uh, so for testing purposes, if I put this at daily, and then hit play, I should be generating one file every day. Alright, so yes, I did generate a file. Um, I, I guess I moved it off the window so it stopped uh, counting. Okay, so if I go back to this one, this pauses. Um, so I forgot to put .csv, which makes it not quite as helpful. So down here, when we specify the file name, we need to do .csv. And then um, instead of dumping them directly into a uh, this root level of the folder. Let's actually clean this up a little bit and create a data folder. Data. And if we're going to do multiple runs, then it'd be nice to distinguish the files. So what we can do is um, before, at the beginning of the file name, we can have a unique um, a time stamp of, of when the simulation actually started. Okay, so apparently my uh, screen recorder was frozen, and I don't want to re-record it, so I'm just going to show you what I did. So um, I have a string data folder here, and um, this gets assigned here. So we need data to point to the data folder inside of our asset folder, and then we append to it um, the start time of the simulation, basically. Then when we get down to our generate report, we check to see if that folder exists. If it doesn't exist, then we create it. So we do directory.create directory, we give it the name. Um, then when we define our file name, we added a data folder to the beginning of the, the file name path. So this is really the file name path, and then it opens it, and everything else is the same. Um, so this is set up and running, and then if we look at the this, now we have um, our root directory, then we have data, then we have the start time, and then it's populating hourly. So yeah, this is going. Uh, that gives you something to play with. I, I actually played with this before, and um, the ran it for a year and looked at how the wealth added up over time and it looks uh, it looks um at first glance like pretty good so uh, take a look at it see what see what you can do 
Um, I guess one thing worth mentioning is um, you can specify the number of employees that are in each of these occupation types, but you still need to use Excel to figure out the proportions of workers that should be in each of those types. So if we go back to here, this one should be fine. Uh, yeah, this is the right one. We can create a pivot, a pivot table. And then we can throw in occupation type and then look at uh, the sum of their percents. And so these are these are the percents. So like say you want um, so it generates roughly like six fifty workers. So say you want six hundred jobs, uh, then you would need to do something like this divided by a hundred. And then in Excel, there's a, a trick if you want to copy and paste. Well, actually, I don't know if it'll work with the pivot table. Okay, so let's actually do this. Let's uh, take these, paste these here as values. So that's how many jobs we want. So we want to take this, divide it by 100, and then multiply it by this. But we don't want this number to change, so we can put dollar signs here, and that will lock it so it'll always use that absolute reference so if you look at this this is still using e3 yeah so if you have a if you want 600 jobs and you want to use all of these categories then this is how they would they would break down um so just kind of keep that in mind, and and we'll see what uh, you you come up with. All right, thanks.